This is Dr. Dave Mathewson presenting his New Testament History and Literature, Lecture Number 9, Mark, Background, and Themes. All right, let's get started. Uh, what we'll do today is uh, move on to uh, Gospel Number 2, the second Gospel, which we know is the Gospel of Mark. So we'll uh, actually move through it quite a bit more quickly than we did through Matthew. As I said, as we move through the New Testament, a number of times we will slow down and, and uh, uh, come down for a closer look. At other times, we'll, we'll uh, have a, a, a perspective from above and move over and through documents rather quickly. Um, Mark is one of those documents that uh, we'll, we'll move through rather quickly, but still, I want to focus on what is distinctive about Mark, uh, how is the gospel put together, what's it doing, and what does it say about Jesus? How does the gospel of Mark present Jesus? Uh, how does he want us to understand him? Uh, uh, one word of announcement, though, the first, you'll notice that uh, next week is week five, and so there is an exam coming up uh, on the background material and the Gospels. Uh, you can look for that either next Friday or it may not be till Monday. We'll know for sure. I'll, I'll be able to give you a better idea by Monday of next week. Uh, so you can look for exam number one coming up a week from today or the following Monday, which I, I can't remember what specific day that is. Uh, that means also that there is an extra credit review session slash discussion session. I said the, the way, one way you can earn extra, or the only way to earn extra credit in this class is that uh, there will be four review slash discussion sessions that will basically coincide with the four exams. And you can, uh, there, there are opportunities for those of you uh, I just want to make this clear. For those of you that uh, with the ASC Academic Support Center, if you're in connection with them, there will be other study sessions for review sessions, but those do not count for, those are separate from this class. Those do not count for extra credit. The only sessions that count for extra credit will be the four sessions that I will designate, and I'll tell you more uh, about that on Monday, but there will be one of those next week as well. Uh, an extra, extra credit uh, review, again, uh, depending on what you want to do with it, it can be used for review for the exam, that's usually what happens, or to discuss anything related to the classroom material or New Testament, uh, but usually it, it ends up being a review session for the exam, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, that, will be, that will be the thing that uh, is available for extra credit. There are four of them. You'll get extra credit for how many ever you show up uh, at, uh, so if you only get one, you'll get extra credit for that. Again, I would remind you that extra credit does not show up in the exam. It'll show up at the end of, of the semester in your, your final grade. So I'll be announcing more about that on Monday as well. But uh, there will be a, an extra credit review session uh, next week, and I'll give you more information about that. All right, let's open with prayer, and then we'll look at uh, the Gospel of Mark. Father... Uh, thank you for the, the weekend, and I pray that we'll find time to uh, rejuvenate and uh, to, at the same time, perhaps catch up in some reading and whatever else we have to do. Uh, Lord, I pray now that you'll help us to focus our attention for uh, this class period on uh, the book of Mark and to be able to hear it as, as uh, perhaps it would have been heard and read and understood in its first century context but uh, to be able to bridge the gap to the 21st century and to hear it as, as your word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, just a, a very brief review. We just got done looking at the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, we looked a little bit at, at Matthew's distinct portrayal of Jesus. As I said, it, it perhaps may have been helpful in some ways if the church would have just had one grand gospel of Jesus about Jesus and kind of combined all four gospels to give us all the information in one place. But interestingly, the church allowed four very separate and different gospels to stand because they all have something unique to say about who Jesus is. And when you look at Matthew's portrayal, of, of Jesus, what would you say is, is unique about the way Matthew portrays Jesus? 
if you saw a question like this on an exam or something like that, what would you answer? What's, uh, what is unique about the way Matthew presents Jesus so far? What, what did Matthew seem to emphasize? How, how did he portray Jesus as what or who? Okay, as a teacher, remember the five, five blocks of discourse, Matthew wants to portray Jesus as a teacher. What else? Okay, very good. That's a very important one. As the Messiah, son of David. But Matthew went on to emphasize Jesus is not only the son of David or Messiah for Jews, but also for Gentiles as well. That's a very key theme in Matthew, along with Jesus' teacher. Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah, in fulfillment of the Old Testament promises, but he's Messiah and son of David, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles as well. Anything else? What, what else how else did... Uh, Matthew portrayed Jesus as a new Moses. Uh, as in the same way Moses led and delivered his people out of Egypt and rescued them, in the same way Jesus comes as a new Moses, as one greater than Moses, to rescue and deliver his people. And I think there's one other, one other title we looked at or distinctive feature. He's a teacher, he's a Messiah, son of David for Jews and Gentiles. He's a new Moses, one who comes to deliver his people. He's what, the one who fulfills the Old Testament. Jesus is the climax of the entirety of the New Testament. All the, the New Testament stories and themes and motifs all find their climax and fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And then I think we said Jesus is also portrayed as Son of God, the one who stands in a unique relationship with the Father. So those are the themes that uh, Matthew particularly uh, uh, emphasizes as he paints a portrait of Jesus Christ. Now, what we'll do today is, in addition to looking at the main message and purpose of Mark and the unique features of Mark, we want to be alert to how does Mark portray Jesus? Uh, how does, uh, what does Mark choose to emphasize G about Jesus that may not necessarily be present in Matthew, although there, there are some overlaps as well in the way that Mark and, and Matthew treat Jesus. But starting with Mark, the first question to ask about the gospel number two or the second gospel is who is the author? Well, you might say, well, that's rather easy. It's Mark because the Bible says it. Uh, the gospel according to Mark. Uh, but remember we said that, um, uh, that, that the, the attribution of authorship to the four gospels really came with the later church. Uh, the, when Mark originally wrote his gospel, he did not start the gospel according to Mark, then the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he didn't write the gospel according to Mark. That was put there by the later church. However, it's, it's meant to reflect the, uh, I, I think, what is a reliable tradition and reliable uh, understanding and indication of who the author of, of it was, of the gospel was. Uh, the, the primary source of our understanding, or, or one of the main sources of our understanding, is a statement, statement by an individual named Papias. Uh, Papias, an individual who, who uh, very early on, not long after the formation of the New Testament, wrote that Mark was the interpreter of Peter, and Mark, so that Mark's gospel is meant at some level to reflect Peter's preaching and teaching. So Mark was a, an associate of Peter. He's also mentioned in some of Paul's letters, apparently an associate of Paul as well. So, so Mark was an associate of Paul, an associate of Peter, and perhaps Peter's kind of, kind of his interpreter. He, he's kind of summarizing at some level and emphasizing what it was that Peter taught and preached. Now, why was the Gospel of Mark written? Uh, now, I debated whether I should start with this. It'd probably be best to save it to the end after we've looked at the distinct features of Mark, but it might help us to see the distinct features of Mark if we had an understanding already of the purpose of Mark. And, uh, interestingly, too, there are a number of church fathers and early church leaders, and again, church fathers are those that church leaders that lived from the second to approximately the fourth century A.D. So roughly, uh, you know, up until two, three hundred years after the writing of the New Testament. But but a number of church fathers seem to associate the Book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, with Rome, with the city of Rome. 
So that uh, most likely Mark is probably addressing a church or churches. Uh, in the first century, most, they're, they're probably in, in most cities, there would have not been one church. Uh, there would have been smaller house churches, especially in a city the size of Rome. Whether they got together on occasions or not is, is possible, I'm not sure. But, but uh, most likely, Mark is probably addressing a group of Christians, a church or house churches in the city of Rome, who are struggling. Uh, if you remember, uh, Nero, uh, not too long after uh, the book, Gospel of Mark is written, or, or about the same time, this is when Nero wreaked havoc. Nero is the emperor that wreaked havoc on Christians and treated them rather cruelly. Uh, so cr Christians, uh, Christians had a rather hard go of it in the city of Rome. And, and Mark is probably addressing Christians who are struggling with living out their faith in the hostile environment of Rome. Whether he was addressing that, who, Christians who were actually going to persecution under Nero or, or after or before is uncertain. But, but uh, perhaps Mark is addressing Christians or a church living in Rome who are struggling living out their faith in the hostile environment in Rome. And now Mark is going to write basically to encourage them to, to show them that they're struggling. Basically what he's going to do is say they're, they're, the fact that they're suffering and struggling is nothing less than at the heart of the gospel. The fact that they are suffering and struggling is basically following the exact same path that Jesus Christ went as well. So, so Mark, Mark's gospel is very pastoral. That is, again, Mark isn't just writing... A, a, Here's a life of Christ, just in case you're interested. Mark is trying to portray Christ and Christ's life in a way that will address his readers who are struggling with their faith under the, and with following Christ under, in this hostile environment in, in the city of Rome. And now Mark writes to encourage them uh, to, by showing them, demonstrating that, uh, that, that that's basically is how Christ's life went. It was one of suffering. Uh, and so his readers should expect nothing less. In fact, uh, the Gospel of Mark, the way it's, it's put together... Now my computer just froze up. The way that Mark is put together, uh, you'll notice in, in your notes, is uh, it can be divided into three parts. The first, the first 13 verses of Mark are kind of the introduction. They introduce you to the main characters, uh, kind of introduce you to what the book is about. But the rest of the gospel, the first, starting with verse 14 into chapter 8 and about verse 30, the entirety of that section of Mark is basically devoted to the ministry of Christ. It, it, just, it just gives you an account of the things that Christ did. And basically, the one word that kind of characterizes Christ's ministry in these chapters is that Christ is triumphant. Uh, I, was, I was at a lecture the other day uh, for a, a candidate for the Biblical Studies Department, and he, he showed a number of slides of, of uh, ancient draw paintings and portraits of the Gospel of Mark. And Mark, the Gospel of Mark was all, almost always associated with a lion. Uh, the animal, uh, often in the, in the first early centuries of the church, the four Gospels were often associated with different animals. Uh, uh, John was an eagle, uh, and uh, Mark, Mark was associated with a lion. That reflects the first eight chapters of, of Mark where Jesus is portrayed as triumphant. And there's a strong emphasis in this section on Christ's deity. Uh, we'll, we'll see that in, in just a moment. So, so Jesus performs miracles, uh, he heals people, uh, Jesus forgives someone's sins, and someone says no one but God can forgive sins. So, so Jesus is portrayed as triumphant, which this lecture I was at suggested that's why the lion is often associated with the Gospel of Mark. Uh, however, starting in chapter 8, verse 31, the Gospel takes a drastic turn. In that starting with eight, chapter 8, verse 31, 
to the end of the gospel, the emphasis becomes Jesus suffering and his eventual death. Now, what is, what is uh, unique and interesting about this outline? Just looking at it on your, your notes, the division of the gospel, what do you note that's, that's kind of interesting about it? Or what, what kind of stands out to you in, in the way Mark is structured? Well, you have more or less both of those middle two sections, second section and third section, are about equal in length. That's right. The two, ex except for the introduction, the two sections... The, t the two main sections, Jesus' ministry, where he's triumphant, and, and the rest of it are of, of equal length. That is, another way of saying that is almost, about half of Mark's gospel is devoted to the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. So much so that one scholar said that Mark was basically a passion narrative with an extended introduction. Uh, trying to highlight the fact that Mark emphasizes the suffering and death of Jesus Christ uh, in disproportion to the amount the, the other Gospels do. So al almost half of Mark's Gospel is devoted to the death and the suffering, uh, the, the suffering of Jesus Christ. As starting with chapter 8, 31, Jesus begins his, his march toward Jerusalem, and it's all couched in his suffering and predictions of his suffering, the fact that he would die, and, and then narrating, uh, narrating finally Jesus' death uh, in the latter chapters of Mark. So nearly half of the gospel is devoted to, uh, devoted to the, the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Why do you think that might be? Given what we said about the purpose, why do you think Mark did that? Why, why would he, why would, again, you can start to see the gospel writers are not just narrating history. Yes, I think they're historical, but, the, but they're putting together the information in a way that will communicate their theological perspective on Christ. Why, why might, given our, the purpose we talked about, why might Mark devote half of the gospel to the passion and suffering and death of Christ? Yeah. Right, yeah, to demonstrate for, for Christians who are struggling and perhaps suffering at the hands of Rome to some degree for their faith, Mark would be demonstrating that that's part and parcel of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus himself suffered. In, in fact, the, the two halves of the gospel are, are both necessary. Mark narrates them both so that it, we might even say triumph comes, Jesus' triumph came through suffering. And so Mark's readers would triumph as well, but they must go the path of suffering. Uh, so again, even the way Mark has structured his gospel by devoting half of it to the uh, passion and suffering and death of Christ, he's, he's uh, trying to say something to his readers about how they should look at their suffering as, as well. One of the key, uh, another key theme one of the key themes in the Gospel of Mark is that Mark also, although it's, it's not the only theme or the main theme, but a key one, is Mark presents Jesus as bringing about and inaugurating a new exodus. And where he gets that is this. Back in the Old Testament prophets, especially the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, almost all throughout his book, he presents... God's salvation of Israel, and remember, Israel is in exile for their sins and for disobedient, uh, disobedience, and the prophet Isaiah tells the Israelites that, that God will intervene to deliver them and save them and bring them back and restore them as his people. And interestingly, more than any other prophet, the, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah portrays that deliverance and rescue as a new exodus like the old one back in the book of Exodus. In the same way that God rescued his people uh, uh, under, under Moses, in the same way he rescued them from bondage to Egypt. Remember, the, the Israelites were under foreign bondage and oppression in Egypt. In the same way God delivered them and brought them to the land, God would do that in another, a new and greater Exodus again in the future. Now, what Mark wants you to understand is Jesus is inaugurating that new exodus from the book of Isaiah. Uh, 
that that new exodus and salvation that, and deliverance that Isaiah promised God would bring, now Jesus is finally bringing that about. And so Mark, uh, we saw that was present in Matthew as well. Matthew did present Jesus as a new Moses and, and delivering his people uh, from exile. But uh, Mark does that as well. Mark emphasizes also that Jesus is fulfilling this, this prophetic expectation from Isaiah of a new exodus where God would rescue his people and bring about a new creation, bring about their salvation and redemption. And now Jesus Christ was, was fulfilling and accomplishing that. One of the key verses, uh, one of the key verses in Mark that uh, you need to be aware of, that, that's, whether it is the main verse of Mark, that's why I call it a key verse and not necessarily the key verse, but it, it seems to capture how Mark wants to present Jesus and may, in fact, may kind of encapsulate and summarize Mark's primary view of Jesus, is found in chapter 10 in the suffering section, chapter 10 and verse 45. So Mark 10 and verse 45, Mark summarizes and says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, in, in fact, this verse may reflect, again, now you have to go back to the Old Testament again. Uh, in Isaiah, again, in the prophet Isaiah also talks about not only a new exodus, but a, this suffering servant motif from Exodus 53. Uh, you remember that text, all we like sheep have gone astray. That's all in the context of this suffering servant that would suffer on behalf of Israel. Now Jesus is being portrayed as that. So this, 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 uh, uh, this verse uh, 1045, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life up in death as a ransom for the many, may summarize... Uh, uh, at least uh, one of Mark's key emphases about Jesus Christ, that he is the suffering servant. He is the one who comes to suffer for his people. And that fits very well, as we saw, Mark's purpose, to address Christians suffering and struggling to live out their faith in the hostile environment of Rome. And now Jesus portrayed as that suffering servant from Isaiah who comes to give his life as a ransom for many. So remember, remember that uh, uh, Mark 10.45 as a key verse for understanding Mark's portrayal of Jesus Christ. So that's a little bit about kind of how the gospel is, is uh, put together. Uh, and, but I want to then focus more specifically, like we did on Matthew, what are some of the key themes of Mark? Again, what does he emphasize besides the new exodus uh, from Isaiah we saw, uh, Jesus' is suffering, uh, what, or an emphasis on his death, his suffering? Uh, what else does Mark emphasize that you don't find emphasized in the other Gospels or not to the same extent? Again, we saw that, uh, we saw that Matthew presents Jesus as the... the uh, uh, the new Moses, he presents him as a teacher. He presents him as the son of David, the Messiah for Jew and Gentile, uh, as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, Old Covenant scriptures. How does Mark present Jesus? The first thing is, along with this theme of suffering, uh, it, it would be incorrect to only focus on his suffering alone because he, Mark does devote half of his gospel to Jesus' ministry where Jesus is portrayed as triumphant. And, and victorious. Uh, but the first thing to say about Mark is, more than any other gospel, Mark seems to maintain and emphasize a balance between Jesus' humanity and his deity. Uh, Mark wants to portray Jesus as both divine, yet at the same time, a human being. Uh, and again, that fits perfectly, that fits perfectly Mark's goal, to show Jesus is both triumphant as God, but he's also a human being who suffers for his people. And that fits his message, to, to demonstrate to the readers that, that the, the route to triumph, his, the readers would triumph, but they must go the path of suffering first of all. 
uh, again, addressing Christians suffering and struggling with their faith in the, uh, the hostile environment of Rome. So, so Mark portrays Jesus in a balance between his humanity and his deity. Again, there's plenty of emphasis on, on Jesus' deity. For example, in, in chapter, one of the clearest indications of this is very early on in the gospel, in, uh, in chapter 2 and verse 5, Chapter 2 and verse 5, this is, a, this is a, one of the early miracles that Jesus performs early on in the gospel. Uh, where This is where uh, Jesus is teaching in a house and these uh, individuals have someone who is a paralytic who's crippled on, and they carry him in on a mat. It's so crowded that they can't get him in the house so they go up on the roof and lower him down. And Jesus addresses him and says, uh, this is chapter 2 and verse 5, Jesus addresses this individual and says, uh, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. And then it goes on and says, some of the scribes, remember the scribes we talked about, those, the experts, the, kind of the, those who were responsible for recording and, and studying the law, the Old Testament. The scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak in this way, referring to Jesus? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, they got that part right. So in forgiving sins, Jesus basically is taking upon himself a prerogative that belongs only to God. And the scribes correctly understood that in forgiving sins, he claims to be God. Uh, so, so Mark has this balance then between Jesus' deity as, as uh, the one who, like God, can only forgive sins, but then he'll turn around and say, but the Son of Man came not to serve be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So that balance between Jesus' humanity and his deity. Uh, again, which fits perfectly what Mark is trying to do in addressing readers who are suffering uh, and struggling to live out their faith in, in the city of Rome. Uh, there, there, may be, there may be a couple of other things, uh, a couple of other things I need to emphasize. One of those is Mark may also... Mark may also, though I don't think it's the main thing he's doing, but he may also be reacting to, uh, to this idea in, in the first century world of what was often known as a divine man. That is, a conception of Jesus as some kind of a supernatural miracle worker. And so perhaps Mark also wants to tone that down by present, showing that, no, Jesus is not just a supernatural miracle worker, some divine man. He, he's also a, a suffering human being as well. Uh, furthermore, a, another thing I need to emphasize is, is Mark often portrays Jesus as claiming to be the Son of Man. Now the question is, what, does, what did he mean by that? In fact, throughout all the Gospels, in a sense, I will broaden out and talk a little bit about all the Gospels, but Mark, in numerous places, refers to Jesus as Son of Man, or has Jesus calling himself the Son of Man. Uh, what, what does he mean by that? And usually what we've done, and there's a long tradition of associating Son of Man and Son of God, so that Son of God refers to Jesus' deity, the fact that he's God, he stands in a unique relationship with God. And Son of Man is a reference to Jesus' humanity. So how many of you have heard it that way? Uh, just, I've always been taught that way. There's, there's even a, a couple hymns we sing that, that uh, indicate that. Uh, again, Son of Man means Jesus was a human being. Son of God refers to the fact that he was God. Uh, that, that's only partially true. Son of Man most likely... That title, Son of Man, comes, for the most part, comes out of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and particularly uh, Daniel chapter 7. And uh, listen, to what, um, listen to what Daniel says. He says, as I watch, first of all, Daniel's, Daniel has a vision. And he sees a vision of four beasts, these four hideous-looking beasts. The fifth thing he sees, after he sees these four beasts, he sees something else. And here's what it is. He says, And I watched, and thrones were set in place, 
and an ancient one, or the ancient of days, clearly God, took his throne, his clothing was as white as snow, his hair and his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire, a stream of fire issued and flowed from his presence, etc., etc. The court sat in judgment and books were open. And I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words of the horn, which from one of those beasts, and I watched and the beast was put to death. And he says, and then I watched, and I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him, to the son of man, was given dominion and glory and kingship to all, that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting one that shall never pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed." Now I ask you, does that sound like a human being to you? This son of man who comes in the clouds of heaven and an eternal everlasting kingdom. I mean, he can just go up to the throne of the ancient of days and receive an eternal everlasting kingdom. Does that sound like a mere human being to you? I would suggest that son of man is just as much a title of Jesus' deity as it was his humanity. Sometimes Jesus could turn it around and say, yes, this, this, this son of man from Daniel 7, this exalted heavenly being from Daniel 7, sometimes he, he's portrayed as suffering in the Gospel of Mark. So, uh, so, so it, it, was a, it was a word, a phrase, son of man was a title that fit Jesus' purposes very well. It, he could use it to refer to the fact that he was, in fact, this, this son of man, this divine heavenly being who would, reserve, who would receive an eternal kingdom from Daniel 7. But then he could turn around and say, but the son of man is going to suffer and die. So it's a, a phrase he could use uh, for often for his own purposes. But, but the point is, don't think that son of God means deity, son of man means humanity. It's not quite that easy. Son of man from Daniel 7 is just as much a title of Jesus' deity. Son of man from Daniel 7 refers to that heavenly being uh, who will receive an eternal kingdom. That's certainly more than just a, a, a title of his humanity. All right? Another interesting feature of Mark, so the, the first one then is a balance between Jesus' humanity and deity, which, as we've seen, fits Mark's purpose very well to encourage suffering, struggling Christians. Uh, another interesting emphasis in, Ma in Mark uh, that, again, it's not exclusive to Mark, but it's, it's certainly emphasized, is what has often been called the messianic secret or the secret messiah. And what I mean by that is this. When you read through Mark numerous times, you find somebody, Jesus will do something and someone will say, you are the Christ. Or, or, or Jesus even will ask someone, who do you say that I am? They'll say, you are the Christ. And he'll say, now don't go and tell anyone. Well, why does Jesus do that? I mean, th that's not a very good evangelistic strategy. Uh, that they, they get it right. Yes, you're the Messiah. And then he says, well, don't go tell anyone. I, I, I thought this news was to be spread to all the nations. And now Jesus goes around and tells people not to tell anyone who he is. Uh, scholars call that the messianic secret, or I say the, the secret Messiah, that, that uh, Jesus is basically trying to keep it hush-hush, and, and he doesn't want it spread. Why do you think this is the case? Why, why would Jesus tell people not to tell everyone who he was? Okay, so part of it would be because the full understanding of who Jesus was would not come, his, his full messiahship would not come until after his resurrection that would, would uh, demonstrate the true nature of, of his messiahship. So part of it was he, he hadn't entered fully into his reign as messiah until his death and resurrection. There's also probably one other uh, uh, reason as well. I, th I think that's one of them. Uh, possibly because a lot of the Jews said he was messiah. Okay. So it could cause unrest. Well, All right. So probably be to avoid misunderstanding, you're right, uh, to, to go back to some of the history, political history we looked at, is most Jews' conception of the Messiah would be one who was going to come and wipe out the Romans. Uh, 
is here's our king who's going to rule with an iron scepter. I mean, did, did, didn't Isaiah chapter 9 say that? Unto us a son is born, a child is given. He will sit on his throne and rule forever. And so here is that Messiah who will rule over Israel's enemies, meaning he's going to wipe out the Romans. But Jesus does not offer that kind of a kingdom. Jesus does not yet come as that kind of a king. He comes first to suffer and die for the sins of the people. And so one of the reasons would also would have been not only because, I, I think you're exactly right, Jesus' messiahship would not be fully understood until after his resurrection, but uh, to avoid misunderstanding. Again, if, if uh, you go spreading the word around that here's a Messiah, people might come for the wrong reason, thinking here's our deliverer who will, who will uh, basically unseat the Romans from their, their rule. So for that reason, Jesus frequently would tell people to remain silent, uh, probably so as not to be misunderstood as to what kind of a Messiah he was. Because again, he comes first and foremost to suffer and die for the sins of the people. Uh, that would be the already. Remember our already but not yet? The not yet is when he comes with the iron scepter to rule and set up his kingdom and, and defeat his enemies. But the, the already, the first time Jesus comes to offer himself as the Messiah, he comes to suffer and die for the people. All right. Another important theme, much like Matthew in Mark, is an emphasis on disciples and discipleship. Uh, so there's a, a, an emphasis on this group of followers that Jesus uh, uh, puts together, uh, who he will train and prepare to carry on his ministry. However, there's an interesting twist in Mark. When you compare Mark and Matthew, Mark seems to portray the disciples in, in a little bit more negative light. That is, the disciples in Mark are, over and over again, are, are portrayed as just not getting it. They're, they're obtuse, they misunderstand, they're, they fail, they, they don't have faith, they, they just don't quite get it. And the disciples are portrayed that way over and over again in Mark's gospel. As over against Matthew, where in Matthew they still have problems getting it sometimes. But uh, when you compare the two, it just... It, it's, not that Mark, it's not that Matthew portrays them in a better light. It's just that Mark seems to portray them in, in, in a, a lesser light than, for example, Matthew does. Again, he has them misunderstanding. He has them uh, just not getting it and, and not having much faith. Again, one could ask the question, why would Mark do that? Why would Mark portray the disciples and, and emphasize their failure to understand and their failure to get it? and their weakness and their lack of faith. Why would Mark do that? Given, again, let's go, go back and think about the purpose, why Mark's writing, the, the background, uh, who Mark's writing to. Why might, in light of that, why might Mark portray the disciples in a slightly more negative light? Again, that they, they just don't get it, they don't understand, they fail to understand, they, they don't believe. Uh, yeah. Kind of Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If if the disciples who are closest to Jesus stumbled and, and struggled, then certainly uh, that is meant to encourage Mark's readers who likewise are struggling and and may think that they're failures in their faith, and to show them no that even Jesus' disciples struggled as well. Uh, so Mark's Mark's portrayal, even his portrayal of the disciples, is probably meant to. Uh, be, to reflect the struggles that his marked readers are going through as well. Another theme, another important theme in Mark is the uh, emphasis on good news or uh, gospel. The very first verse opens with this, uh, the beginning of the gospel or the good news, depending on what uh, translation you have. Uh, Mark is the only of the four Gospels to actually call his book good news or a gospel. Now, that may not necessarily be a reference to the kind of literature, but more the content. But, but Mark is the first Gospel, or the first of the four, only, only the four Gospels to call his book good news or a gospel. 
Uh, furthermore, Mark includes the word gospel, a form of the word gospel or good news, seven times. Whereas I think Matthew might have, I think he has it four times. And I can't remember, Luke might have it once or twice. But, but clearly, especially given the fact that Mark is so much shorter than the other Gospels, uh, Mark, Mark includes that word seven times, which suggests there's something important about it. Uh, now, what is important about that word? We've, again, we've, we've uh, kind of taken that and made a rather technical term about it. The Gospel means the message about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for my sins and I need to tell everyone so they'll believe in Jesus' name and have eternal life and forgiveness of sins and that's certainly true. But where, what, what does Mark mean by that term? Where did he get it? Again, there's two important backgrounds and you have to understand uh, uh, th this goes back again to our, our survey of the political and historical climate leading up to the New Testament. Uh, even Jewish even writers that would have been thoroughly Jewish, such as Matthew, even writers that were thoroughly Jewish in their thinking and orientation, would not have escaped the influence of Roman rule and Greek language as well and Greek culture. So they, even they would have been affected by it to some extent. And sometimes, I'm convinced, an author in the New Testament will often use terminology that actually has the, a, a, a point of content, a contact with both the Greco-Roman world and readers and would also appeal to the Jewish world and, its, and, and Jewish readers. And the word gospel is a good one, example of that. So for, first of all, the word gospel, where Mark got it, the word gospel or good news was not just, that's not just a Christian word that, uh, Mar that Mark made up or Paul or, or someone else. That word already occurs in the Old Testament and it goes back to the prophet. Which one would you guess? Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, or you say Isaiah. Uh, I always have to explain myself. I went to school and uh, did my postgraduate work in Scotland, and that's how they pronounced Isaiah, Isaiah. And it just stuck with me, so I still say it that way. So, uh, but I'm sure that's the correct way if that's how they say it in Scotland. That's, <laughs> that's how it has to be right. Uh, but Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, it, remember we've already said he, he talks about a new exodus where God, like he did in the original exodus, taking the people out of Egypt, uh, he also portrays Jesus as inaugurating a new exodus. He talks about a, a, a new creation, God restoring his people, entering into a new covenant. That is the good news the gospel that, uh, that the, the book of Isaiah talks about. So what Mark is doing, by using the word gospel or good news, again, this isn't just a new term. He's again showing that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Isaiah's promise of restoration and salvation. Uh, so this, this is a term that goes back to the Old Testament. Again, by using good news, he's, he's doing something similar that Matthew did, showing that Jesus is the fulfillment, the, this, this good news of deliverance in, in God's kingdom, ruling over all things, a new creation, a, a new covenant with his people. That good news from Isaiah is now being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So I'm convinced the first readers of Mark would, when they heard, here's the, the beginning of the gospel, they would have gone back to Isaiah and said, okay, now we understand what that is. Now the, the, the promised deliverance, the restoration of God's people, the, God's rule over his people and, and the entire earth is now being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. However, again, we said that uh, oftentimes the New Testament authors would use vocabulary that had resonances in more than one world, not only the Jewish world and, and literature, but also the Greco-Roman world. So that, uh, for example, the word good news or gospel was also a word used in association with the emperor. For example, the birth of the emperor would be proclaimed as good news or the gospel, using that, exams, ex, uh, that same exact word. Or, or, or other events surrounding what the emperor did or, or something connection with the emperor would be good news or the gospel. So it's also possible that, again, readers, if these are Christians living in Rome, when they hear the good news, this may be somewhat of a subversive claim. Uh, 
that the gospel now, the true good news, is not associated with Caesar, but now uh, someone who now asserts that, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. The true good news centers around not what Caesar does, but centers around what Jesus Christ is now going to do uh, for and has done for his people. Uh, so uh, that, that word for Mark is an important one, but it, it also, not only in, in kind of summarizing what his book is about, but also from the standpoint that it, it probably resonates with two different backgrounds, both a Jewish from Isaiah the prophet, but also a Greco-Roman world, the, the good news associated with the emperor or some, something to do with the emperor. The last thing to look at with Mark is, uh, before we do, I, I want to talk a little bit about how Mark ends, but any questions so far as far as what, what Mark emphasizes? You, you kind of start to get, get a picture of what Mark's doing, how he's put his gospel to get what he's trying to emphasize and especially the, the themes of triumph and suffering and how he's accomplished that through what he emphasizes. All right, I, I want to talk briefly about how Mark ends. And uh, if, if uh, you open your Bible, no, no matter what translation, virtually no matter what translation you have, and uh, I would like to be able to skip this, but because... No matter what translation you have, it's so overt, and you're confronted with it as soon as you get to the end of Mark, that you wonder what is going on. Now, uh, if, you, if you have a Bible and you, you open it to Mark chapter 16, the very end, you'll note that the last few verses, almost the last chapter, is put in brackets in your Bible. And then almost all of them have a footnote under those brackets, like mine begins, this is verse 9 of Mark chapter 16. Mine begins, now after he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out demons. Uh, she went out and told those who had been with him uh, while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and that he had seen, been seen by her, they would not believe it. Uh, after this, he appeared in another form to two of them, etc., etc. So you have this, uh, you, you have this reference to Jesus appearing to different people, starting with Mary Magdalene. Then, then it ends in verses 19 and 20. So then the Lord Jesus, after he spoke to them, was taken into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And then they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by signs that accompanied it. And that's the end of the gospel. However, that section that I just read to you in, I think, just about every English translation is put in brackets. And then it has a little footnote and says, some of the best and oldest manuscripts do not have this ending. Now, what are we to make of that? Did, where did Mark end? Did Mark, did Mark end at verse... In other words, if, if we take out this section in brackets, here's how Mark ends. So they, referring to the, uh, the women, the, the women that go to the tomb, after Jesus dies, he's placed in the tomb, then all it says is the women go to the tomb on the, on, on the next day, on Sunday, and it's empty. And then it says, so they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement seized them, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. End of story. Now, what kind of way is that to end the gospel? So the question is this, this ending that you have in brackets, in you, again, all your Bibles have that, there must be some kind of brackets or parentheses, and then a footnote somewhere that says this ending was, is not found in some of the oldest and best manuscripts. What are we to do? Where did Mark end? Did he end at verse 8? But, but that's a rather strange way to end a gospel with, with women going into the tombs and then they, because of fear, they don't go tell anybody. I mean, is that a way to end a gospel? Or, or did Mark write these verses 9 through 20? Is, is that the correct ending? I mean, certainly we have to have an ending. To this. Certainly you can't end with these, these women going running out, out of fear and not telling anyone. You have to have closure. You have to have Jesus appearing to people 
And you have to have the message spread that Jesus is risen, and then Jesus going, ascending to heaven, and you have to have the gospel spread, going out and spreading like you do in Matthew, the Great Commission. But think about it this way. Is it possible... Is it possible that this ending was written by a well-meaning scribe that thought that very thing? How can Mark end with verse 8? Now that, that's not a proper way to conclude a gospel. It ends, it ends kind of in defeat with these women because of fear. They don't tell anyone. They run for fear. And they don't spread this, the good news of Jesus' resurrection. What way is that to end the gospel? So most likely, a well-meaning scribe, as, as, as Mark was being copied and transmitted for later generations, a well-meaning scribe probably looked at Mark and said, that's not a proper way to end this gospel. I'm going to give it a proper conclusion. And so he, he wrote 9 through 20. That includes Mary telling people and Jesus appearing to people and the message spreading and Jesus ascending to heaven. Well, that raises an interesting issue. Then how do we account for the way Mark ended his gospel? Why would he end that way? Some have suggested, well, actually Mark did write a conclusion, but it got lost somewhere, you know, whether you know, the dog ate it or somebody ripped it off or whatever happened. Something happened to Mark's ending. It, it actually had an ending, but it got lost after verse 8. Uh, that, that, that's possible, but there's, there's no evidence there, there's simply no evidence that actually happened. The, the only evidence we have is the gospel apparently ends at verse 8. So we can ask, why, why might Mark end his gospel like that? Why doesn't he end it like Matthew did, with Jesus appearing to the disciples and saying, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you to the end of the age? Or, or Luke's reference to Jesus ascending to heaven uh, uh, and appearing to different people after his resurrection. Mark has none of that. And said, Mark ends with failure. Mark ends with the failure of these women to go out and because, of, because they're afraid, they don't go out and do anything. Why would Mark end that? I mean, I, I, I can't think, I, I can't imagine that Mark thought that, that, that Jesus uh, didn't appear to anyone. I, I can't imagine that Mark didn't know what happened, especially if he's associated with Peter. Uh, and was Peter's interpreter. I, I can't believe that Mark did not know that Jesus appeared to people and the message got out and Jesus ascended and he told his disciples to spread the Gospels to all nations. Certainly Mark knew something about that. But, but why, why do you think he ends the Gospel the way he does? Why does he end so abruptly with the failure of these women to go and it's not the fact they're women, just the, uh, uh, why does he end with a failure uh, of, of his followers to go out because of fear? They're afraid to go out and say anything. So it ends, they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End of story. I think Matt, maybe he was tired of writing and he just stopped there, forgot to conclude it. Okay, why, and why, why do you think he would make that point about this kind of portray this picture of Christians who are afraid? Again, think again in terms of the overall purpose of Mark. Why would, why would he emphasize that? Christians that are afraid do not spread the gospel because they are fearful to do so. Emphasize their failure to do that. Again, think in terms of what's, what's going on in Mark. What did we say was the overall purpose. Who is Mark writing to? And how might this, how might this fit that? All right. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that, isn't that how the most likely the, the, the readers of Mark, isn't that the situation they're in? Is if, they, if, if they are struggling and feel that they are failures, then this is simply a way of, of uh, again, addressing his readership is, is in the same way even the events surrounding Jesus' resurrection, his followers still failed and didn't get it. So it, it's another way of encouraging the struggling community that Mark is addressing. Uh, however, it's, it's, I would suggest it's not only failure. If you back up, if you back up to verse 6 and 7, uh, the, as the women approach, approach the tomb, they find this figure, 
this brilliant, shining, angelic type figure in the tomb, and the figure says to them, do not be alarmed. It's interesting as, as uh, what they didn't do. Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place where he laid. But go tell his disciples, disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So interestingly, there's still, an, there's still an emphasis on Jesus' presence and his promise. As if Mark wants to balance the failure of his disciples with the promise and presence of Jesus. That despite the failure of the disciples, God's promise will still prevail. Uh, God still pro his promises will prevail and Jesus pr still promises his presence. It's, it's as if he's waiting, still waiting for them. In, in Galilee, in the gospel. So it, it does end in failure, to uh, perhaps because, again, this is reflecting the situation of Mark's readers. They are if, maybe feel failures, that they're struggling with their faith and struggling living their lives in Rome. And now Jesus, uh, Mark, portrays the disciples, even at his resurrection, in the same way, but at the same time balances that with the pre promise of his presence. And the, and the fact that the, uh, God's promises would indeed be fulfilled. Good. Any questions about Mark? Yeah. My um, Bible has a shorter Yeah, you're right. There's another. You're, you're right. Some of your Bibles may have a shorter ending, too, that consists of only a verse or two. Same thing. Some manuscripts of Mark have, don't have the long one. They have a shorter one. And probably it, too, is probably an attempt to give Mark a proper conclusion. Uh, but I'm suggesting as Mark may have deliberately ended at verse 8 uh, because of the reason he's writing. All right, have a good weekend. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, next week is week 5, just for the purpose of your textbook reading, etc. This was Dr. Dave Mathewson presenting his New Testament History and Literature, Lecture Number 9, on Mark, Background, and Themes. Mm -hmm.